holding kids back in third grade. And we'll talk about what that literacy framework might look like. And, you know, there's, uh, it creates a lot of anxiety. The thought of holding a student back really can make parents and students anxious um, about damaging self-esteem. And that's probably the, the biggest reason not to do it. Uh, in addition, you know, it doesn't make any sense at all to hold a, a student back and keep them in a system that hasn't worked through third grade. So you wouldn't ever want to hold a student back unless you had a program that was significantly different than what they'd been exposed to for the first four years of their schooling. Reading skills build cumulatively. So each year that we fail to address a young reader's difficulties, the problem becomes more and more difficult to remedy and the costs mount. At the very end of this slideshow, I will show you um, an intervention that I was involved with in California in the mid-90s um, that intervened early, and I'll show you the, the economic uh, implications of that, which were huge, and for no other reason uh, than for financial reasons, uh, we should get into this early intervention program. And again, most students, only about 10% of kids 10 to 15 percent of kids who don't read at grade level are neurologically miswired. And we would classify those kids as dyslexic. Their neural pathways don't light up, uh, don't connect in the same way that traditional readers do. So there are studies right now with fu functional magnetic resonant imaging. And you can take two students and you control for all the variables that you can. You control for IQ. You control for family socioeconomic status. You can control for parents' level of education. Uh, you can control for the uh, value of literacy in the household. So you take all these, you flatten all these variables, and you put two students under functional magnetic imaging. And the only difference between the kids, the only um, significant difference between the two kids is one child's ability to read and the other's ability, the difficulty in reading. And you turn the machine on, giving them the same passage to read. You will see the traditional students, readers, um, neural pathways light up in a predictable way. The student who struggles to read, their neural pathway doesn't light up in the same way and doesn't have the same uh, brain structure same neural structure uh, for that to work efficiently. The good news with that is with good instruction and good intervention, the brain, there's brain plasticity at a young age all the way up into you know, late adulthood, up until the late 20s, um, where that neural pathway can be reestablished. So you can take that student who doesn't read, give them really good intervention, and three months later, put them under the magnetic resonant imaging machine, and you can start to see the neural pathways light up the way they should. With further reinforcement and practice, the neural connections can be made, and you know, reading fluency can be attained. So that, when reading problems are identified and addressed early, the vast majority can be successfully remediated. Um, what we're looking at now from a research standpoint is only about two to four percent of kids who have a, a neurological reading problem uh, cannot be taught to read fluently. Okay, so that's a very, very small percentage of kids. Um, and it's probably uh, more on the side of two percent than four percent. Okay, so what's happened uh, in Florida? Uh, Florida in the mid-1990s uh, was in the top, bottom five of states in terms of their reading achievement. In 1998, only about half of the state's fourth graders could read, and today 72% can. Ten years ago, Florida students were at the bottom from a national perspective, and today's Florida's white fourth graders score higher in reading on the NAEP test than do Minnesota's fourth graders. But Florida's African-American and Hispanic students' scores have risen the fastest. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute. Today, Florida's black fourth graders are about a year and a half ahead of uh, the black peers in Minnesota. 
And it's Hispanic fourth graders are about three years ahead of their peers here. Eighth grade reading scores have risen as well. Between 2003 and 2009, Florida made the largest jump in NAEP eighth grade testing scores of any state in the nation. It's recognized as one of three states to be recognized by the U.S. Department of Education for significantly narrowing the racial and ethnic achievement gap. In 2011, Education Week ranked Florida schools fifth in the nation, based in large part on dramatic improvements in reading scores. And Florida's groundbreaking education reforms do hold valuable lessons for Minnesota. And again, probably the most important aspect of Florida's reading reform campaign has been ending social promotion. So the state schools uh, do a really good job of assessing kids in K through three each year. And based on those assessments, they provide an intensive intervention at the area where the reading process is breaking down. So it's a, high, it's a very diagnostic prescriptive approach. So you're assessing kids, seeing where they break down precisely, and you're providing a very targeted intervention at that breakdown. Okay. Um, on the Florida Comprehensive Assessment Test, the FCAT, if they score one out of five in the reading domain, they're retained for a year unless a good cause exemption applies. And the good cause exemption can simply be a parent saying, I do not want my child retained. I want him moved along. So it, it, it is liberal in that sense. Now what's the difference if a child's retained? Um, the child is not subjected to the same instruction that he had the previous year, uh, but instead, because of a, a very good data system that Florida has, it can link the be highest achieving teachers based on the, the students that they're working with and the growth that the students have shown. Uh, they'll take the highest achieving teachers working with the most at-risk students and assign those teachers to the retained students um, for that second, third grade year. So each one in the second, uh, their second, third grade year, each one gets a new program of intensive intervention tailored to his or her le learning style and taught by a high performance teacher with a track record of success in reading instruction. So Effectively, what Florida does is, and, and what now Minnesota, the, the last legislative session passed, is teacher accountability. Teachers are tied directly to the success or lack of success of their students. And, you know, that's, that's a high accountability standard, um, and it's, it's not fair to teachers if they're not given the professional development training and the curriculum to support that. So you never want to do that without providing what a teacher needs to be a good teacher. No. Yep, it's an entirely separate class. Yeah, it's not just a pull out for reading. Their whole third grade um, is repeated. because. I'll guarantee you, if they're that far behind in reading, they're going to be similarly behind in, in all subject areas. Now, if I, I, I'm guessing, and, and this is, if, if we were in, to implement a program like that here in Minnesota, if you had a child who um, was really struggling with reading and was retained because of it, but was a superstar in math, I'm sure provisions would be made that he would skip into you know, you would stay in a fourth grade math class. You wouldn't want to hold back a student who was excelling. In. But typically, kids who are struggling in reading are usually have a math difficulty too, at that age. Not always, but typically. So the cornerstone of, of this program that they have is a 90 minute block of uninterrupt, uninterrupted scientifically based reading time with a teacher with a proven track record. Okay, and, and they've 
they've had this retention policy now for 10 years, and what they're seeing is those reading gains uh, maintain over time. So after two years, Florida's, Florida's retained third graders outperform their socially promoted peers by about two thirds of a school year. And since 2006, when the first retained third graders entered sixth grade, middle school FCAT reading scores have improved substantially, and the percentage of sixth, seventh, and eighth graders scoring below basic has fallen to 16%, the lowest level ever. Right now, we are. Uh,